Hello, and thank you for joining us in our discourse today entitled The Russo-Ukrainian War, Challenges and Future Scenarios for the Global Order. I'll be your host, uh, Dr. Dustin Bird, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religion at Olivet College. I'm also the founder and co-director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory, which is sponsoring today's discourse. I'm honored to be joined by an esteemed group of scholars from a variety of places in the world, from a variety of academic disciplines and backgrounds, all with their own analysis on the current situation. I'm especially honored to be joined once again by my co-director for the Institute of, uh, for Critical Social Theory, Dr. Sayed Javad Miri, who will moderate our discourse today. I'd like to make a few opening remarks to lay out the situation in Russia, Ukraine, as it relates to the West as well. Uh, years from now, others will watch this on YouTube, and it will be good to paint the picture of what's happening as we discuss it today. On February 24th, 2022, on the orders of the Russian President Vladimir Putin, the Russian military invaded its neighboring country, the independent and democratic state of Ukraine. Deemed a special military operation by Putin, it stated, its stated aim of the war was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, which from Putin's perspective had become too far under the influence of the US and NATO. However, for most of the world, or at least much of the world, this invasion appeared as a war of aggression, an unprovoked attack on a sovereign country with the aim of subjugating Ukraine to the authority of Moscow, as it was when the pro-Russian uh, president, Viktor Yanukovych, was in power in Ukraine. However, such a blitzkrieg invasion did not work. With the leadership of President Volodymyr Zelensky and the backing of NATO countries, the attack on Kyiv was thwarted at least for the first 50 plus days as we are now with today. At the moment, we find Ukraine in a situation wherein the Russian military has withdrawn from the area of Kyiv and has moved to the Donbas region in the east, as well as the Kherson and Mariupol regions in the south. It appears that the attempt to capture Kyiv has been abandoned, and there is a renewed attempt to capture what many Russian nationalists call Novo Russia or New Russia. Just days ago, the flagship vessel of Russia's Black Fleet, the Moskva, was attacked and eventually sunk. It now sits at the bottom of the Black Sea after having been successfully targeted by Ukrainian forces. The Kremlin vows revenge for the sinking of the ship even while it denies the sinking was caused by the Ukrainian missile strike. In the first seven weeks of the war, it has been estimated there has already been 12 to 15,000 Russian soldiers killed and more, that's more than the US sustained in the 20 year war in Afghanistan and more than the Soviet Union sustained in its war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Nevertheless, many times more Ukrainian civilians who appear to be now the principal target of the Russian offensive have lost their lives. Tens of thousands of non-combatants have been killed. Many have been raped and many have been executed. Currently, representatives of the International Criminal Court along with the Ukrainian authorities are gathering evidence for a future war crimes tribunal, vowing to bring to justice all those responsible for the deliberate murder of innocent civilians. The US President Joe Biden, along with numerous other heads of state in Europe, have accused President Putin of engaging in war crimes, including genocide. In response to the invasion, NATO has delivered billions of dollars worth of weapons to Ukraine, which has invoked a protest from Moscow, who warns NATO of unprecedented consequences if such weapons continue to be delivered. They will be. NATO's resolve is unbreakable at this point. In the past week, Sweden and Finland have both signaled their desire to join NATO after decades of following policies that were meant to not antagonize Russia. It appears Putin's attacks on Ukraine has changed their minds. In response, the Kremlin has warned that nuclear weapons could be deployed to the borders of Finland in an attempt to intimidate them into remaining neutral. It will not work. Such threats are meaningless in the world of ICBMs and supersonic weapons. As academics from around the world, I think it is especially incumbent upon us to keep the discourse open, honest, and critical, even when nations are at war, and especially when our own nations are at war. 
We will often be accused by reactionaries as being unpatriotic for not collapsing our consciousness into the mass psychosis of war hysteria. But what choice do we have? If we academics and intellectuals cannot remain honest and critical during times of war, how can we expect the general public to do so? I hope our discourse today, sponsored by the Institute for Critical Social Theory, which is dedicated to finding the truth no matter who it offends, can help us come closer to the truth in the matter of the Russian-Ukrainian war, and in some way help bring this horrible war to an end so that justice and therefore peace can reign supreme. I would like to thank all the presenters for being here today and offering their analyses of the current situation. I am honored to be with you all. And with that, I turn the floor over to my dear brother, Dr. Syed Javad Miri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm thankful to all of you that you have accepted our offer and invitation to join us. We will start with Professor Alexander Azad Khan, Professor of Geopolitics, and uh, he is the editor of many journals, and he has published on these issues of geopolitics and geocultural and economics, international economics and religion for the past two decades. The floor is yours, Professor Azad. It's good to be with you guys. Thanks for your invitation. Uh, I've been up all night, so I think after I hear your presentations, I may have to uh, sort of check out. <clears throat> Before I start, let me preface by stating that International law is a meaningless concept when it only applies to US enemies. Uh, Washington and its allies are guilty of <clears throat> everything that they accuse Russia of and then some. They don't care about justice. All they, it's all about falsely antagonizing their enemies. And there's something so appalling about the same governments and the same media outlets who justified or covered up unspeakable war crimes in Afghanistan, Iraq, <laughs> Syria, Libya, and Yemen to suddenly spring into action for, quote, international justice, unquote. Uh, hypocrites parading themselves as the paragons of virtue. Uh, did you know that the city of Fallujah in Iraq has higher birth defects today than Nagasaki and Hiroshima? because the US used so many chemical weapons and depleted uranium. Most people don't know that. That's not even counting US's massacres in Haditha, another uh, uh, city in Iraq, <clears throat> uh, uh, where US committed war crimes. Uh, Fallujah is just one city amid the entire laundry list of US's crimes just in the past 20 years alone. Having said all that, this war has been a massive failure of Russian messaging, information operations, and public diplomacy. Now, when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war, the first question that uh, we should ask ourselves is, why is it happening? What could possibly justify invading a sovereign independent state like Ukraine? The only way to answer this is by uh, looking at things from a Russian perspective, because in spite of the raging fight on the ground, this war is not really about Ukraine. It's about uh, Russia and its pursuit of geopolitics. It's about the Kremlin and its relationship with the White House. One of, uh, one of Russia's initial demands for de-escalation just before the war erupted for NATO to roll back from Eastern Europe and that's what it ultimately comes down to. In many ways, the Ukrainian conflict echoes the Soviet collapse. Uh, <clears throat> there is certainly an element of nation building culture and history that draws, that draws Russia and Ukraine to each other. But from a geopolitical lens, which is my specialty, the war is bigger than Ukraine. It's about Russia attempting to store or restore the multipolar world order that was lost. Russia believes that it must either be a world power or there will be no Russia. This is the mindset at Kremlin. The collapse of the Soviet Union marked a uh, turning point in global geopolitics. No less than 14 Soviet republics broke away 
and proclaim sovereignty and independence. However, the newly established Russian Federation had lost centuries of geopolitical strife. Russia had been thrown back into its 18th century territorial boundaries. All the sacrifices the Russian Imperial Army and the Soviet Army made were nullified on December 25th, 1991, when the Soviet Union, when the Soviet flag was lowered from Kremlin and was replaced with the flag of Russia. <clears throat> That was a hard pill to swallow and an event that still haunts Russian foreign policy to this day. With the fall of the Soviet Union came broken promises, uh, plummeting healthcare and industrial decay while uh, kinship was replaced with hostility and all those glorious technical marvels and infrastructure projects were left to rot. Tens of millions of lives were lost with nothing to show for it. The death of the Soviet Union was the end of communism as a global force, but it also marked the end of Russia as a superpower for having retreated from its Soviet borders, from its outer shell, what we call an outer shell. Russia itself was severely exposed to dangers emanating from the West. Uh, part of the Russian rationale for invading Ukraine is what we call the what is called the Heartland Theory that was drafted in 1904 by Halford McKinder. Uh, the Heartland Theory basically divides the world in three bodies. The first body is the world island, which consists of Europe, Asia, and Africa. The second body refers to offshore islands like the British Isles and the Japanese archipelago while the third body points to the Americas and Australia as the outlay, uh, outlying uh, islands. With these uh, parameters, uh, there is a special emphasis on the world island because it is the most populous and resource rich land mass. Uh, imagine if a super state, uh, a super state controlled uh, policy making for, I'm sorry, imagine if a super state control policy making from France to China to Saudi Arabia to <clears throat> South Africa. Uh, that power would have the technical prowess of Europe, the resources of Africa and the workforce of Asia. Uh, nothing would stand in its way. So whoever controls the world island uh, would have the means to dominate the globe. However, within the world island, there is the heartland region which extends from Volga River to the Yangtze River in China and from the Arctic to the Caspian Sea. This heartland region is the domain from which a single power would dominate the rest of the world island, provided that the power uh, enjoys stability at home. That power would enjoy stability at home. We're talking about Russia here, obviously. Russia is the power that sits at the center of this theory which is why it resonates with Russian foreign policy. But it gets even more zealous. Uh, further further uh, dissecting the world island into Eastern Europe, uh, Mackender's theory argues that the home territory of the heartland power sits in Eastern Europe. So any power seeking uh, global supremacy would emerge from the Eastern half of the European continent. Uh, it's just about uh, a nod to Russia. Now, uh, Mackinder's uh, theory initially served as a warning to the European powers, but instead became the manifest destiny of Soviet Union. The hardland theory was so powerful that it shaped the course of the Cold War and it continues to dominate Russian geopolitical thinking to this day. Uh, for instance, Alex Alexander Dugin, who is one of the most influential Lus Russian political theorists, have consistently argued for a Russian-based Eurasian power. And the Russian policy-making elite known as the Siloviki still adhere to the heartland <clears throat> theory. According to Andrei Ilyarionov, uh, in his 2009 article in the, uh, the Journal for Democracy titled, Reading Russia, the Siloviki in Charge, uh, in the Russian political lexicon, 
a Silovic, or which is the singular of the plural Siloviki, is a politician who came into politics from the security, military, or similar services, often the officers of the former KGB, GRU, FSB, SVR, FSO, and the Federal Drug Control Services, or another armed services. A similar term is securocrats, which could be law enforcement and intelligence officer. Of course, we all know which person came out of this. Admittedly, it seems strange to use a century old geopolitical theory as a template in foreign policy. But one thing that keeps the heartland theory relevant is the constituency of geography. The earth has a domain over humankind, not vice versa. So having control over Eastern Europe uh, would allow Russia to reclaim its global footage and Ukraine is just the first pit stop. But beyond pursuing a multipolar global order, um, there are also local nuances at play, extending from St. Petersburg to Kazan to Volgograd uh, is the Russian, what we call the Russian core. 80% of the Russian population lives in this area and much of the decision-making by Kremlin is based on the needs and interests of this Russian core. However, uh, the, ter uh, the terrain itself is flat and part of the European plain. Uh, this open green plain widens as it stretches eastward. By the time the European plain reaches the borders of the Russian Federation, its width ex um, eclipses 2,000 kilometers. Uh, no amount of weaponry can fully defend such a vast flat landscape. Seen in this way, the loss of the Soviet boundaries cost the Russians dearly, both politically and economically. Russia is forced to maintain a massive border with some of its most sophisticated, some of the most sophisticated militaries in the world. It has been a costly status quo. Uh, accordingly, to reduce military spending, Russia needs to reduce its exposure along the European plain. To do that, uh, however, uh, Russian policymakers argue that the Russian state needs to anchor by the, Balti uh, by the Baltic Sea and the Carpathian Mountains. Sitting along the north northern rim of the European plain, the Baltic region is an interesting case. Uh, individually, the Baltic nations lack the strength to threaten Russia, but the region as a whole acts as a conduit for great powers to exert pressure on the Russian core. From the Swedish, uh, Swedish uh, incursion in the 18th century to the German invasions in the 20th century, plenty of European powers have tried subduing Russia by going through the Baltics. Today, however, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are part of the NATO, which places them beyond the reach of the Russian subjugation. Be that as it may, geopolitics dictates that Russia take over the Baltics should the opportunity ever present itself. Doing so would allow the Russians to connect the Kaliningrad region to the Russian mainland without tiptoeing through or around NATO territories. Uh, control over the Baltics would also strengthen Russia's presence and hold over the Baltic Sea at large. Meanwhile, the Carpath uh, Carpathian Mountains present an auspicious foothold for the Russians, a buffer against marching armies. The arc that is the Carpathian range is not impenetrable, uh, but it does offer strategic depth uh, to the occupying force in an otherwise flat space. Hitler knew this really well. If the European plane represents a highway or in, uh, for invading armies, the Carpathian Mountains is a speed bump in the middle of that highway. Uh, that strate strategic depth is priceless and that consideration is the ultimate rationale for 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is the topic of my paper or the title of my paper. At the same time, it also means that the Russian objective in Ukraine is to take the entire country that we're seeing basically it's attempting to do. So as much as the rhetoric focuses on Donbass, Kharkiv, Kiev, and Odessa, it misses the larger points. From the Russian angle, they need to push up to the Carpathian Mountains. So Russia needs all of Ukraine, but also all of Moldova. When Bel uh, Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, spoke uh, with the members of the uh, Belarusian Security Council, uh, if, you, if you guys actually uh, Google map or, or uh, uh, search for the picture in Google image, the map he used had an arrow going into the Moldovan separatist region of Transnistria. So had Russia's military invasion of Ukraine gone more successfully, Moldova would have seen fighting as well. By and large, with the invasion of Ukraine, Russia sought to anchor by the Carpathian Mountains. By taking over all of Ukraine and eventually Moldova, Russia would have restored a portion of the Soviet boundaries enough to reduce its exposed flying by the, Euro uh, by the European plane to 600 kilometers, which is a substantial drop from the current 2000 kilometers. Ideally, the Russians would want to push west as much as they can, preferably taking over all of Poland and the Baltics. But uh, one step at a time is their policy. Ukraine is a fighter, uh, is in a fight for its existence. And if Russia wins, the Baltics and Poland are next, count on it. Uh, likewise, if Russia loses the war in Ukraine, or it can't have all, the, uh, all of it today, it will try again tomorrow. No treaty or ceasefire will last. <clears throat> Think of the European plane as a game of chess where each player seeks to maximize the position of its <clears throat> pawn or pawns, shall we say, by strategically placing them. Uh, the further NATO pushes east into the European plane towards the Russian Federation, the more flexible is strategic planning becomes and more room for mistakes it gains. A NATO allied Ukraine would likely see cruise missile launchers on its soil where, where, fight time, where flight time uh, to the Russian core would be around three minutes. Mm -hmm. A buildup like that would force the Russians to spend even more on military by establishing new bases deep in Russian territory. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, east of the border of Ukraine, the flat terrain uh, of the European plain continues uninterrupted for 750 kilometers to the shoreline of the Caspian Sea. Uh, this line known as the Volgograd Gap is fundamental to the existence of the Russian state. Should a hostile force close this gap, it would disconnect Russia from the Caucasus the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And NATO allied uh, Ukraine would uh, certainly look to exploit that vulnerability. Uh, it wouldn't happen overnight. The buildup uh, uh, would be a steady process taking decades, but it would happen nonetheless. Having said that, the reversal is true as well. The more Russia pushes westward, the more secure the Russian core gets, the more room for error it gains and the fewer options NATO has. So a Russian controlled Ukraine would see the militarization of Poland, Romania, and the Baltic nations even more so uh, than at present. Uh, from the Russian point of view, uh, uh, that would uh, balance the scale of things. So all things considered, Ukraine is only one piece in Russia's geopolitical design. Uh, it's still a large uh, piece, but one piece nonetheless. Uh, by taking over Ukraine and then Moldova, Russia mm -hmm. believes it could lift itself as a premier global power while also securing its core demographic space. Uh, going by this, Russia 
going by this for Russia, it's either expand or die. Uh, Russian policymakers, particularly the Stilowiki, believe uh, that political legitimacy comes from military conquest. Uh, they believe that peace is a lie, just another mean, means of decay, like by 1,000 cuts. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Alex. We will get back to you in the Q&A. Professor Charles. Thank you very much and uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to present myself uh, a little bit. I'm uh, from the United States. I'm a former academic and I have been traveling extensively to Cuba for the past uh, 25 years. And uh, when I arrived, I found that the discourse of the political leaders in Cuba as well as the discourse of the academics and the intellectuals in Cuba was far more advanced in their understanding than what I had previously experienced in the United States. So I dedicated myself to seeking to understand uh, a, a, the Cuban uh, perspective. And uh, I, I want to begin by saying that the Cuban revolution is above all an anti neo-colonial revolution. And from that vantage point, it sees certain things in uh, world events. It sees the persistence of US imperialism uh, toward Cuba and toward the rest of the world, a process that goes on for decades. It sees the unsustainability of a neo-colonial world system because of the fact that the world economy and world system has reached and overextended the geographical and ecological limits of the earth. And it no longer can enjoy the same level of ex expansion that it previously was able to enjoy in its heyday. In, in addition, the world economy and world system confront sustained resistance on the part of the peoples of the world and various uh, states uh, as well. The Cuban Revolution also sees the decadence of imperialism, and particularly the decadence of US imperialism. That decadence is particularly seen in the economic decline of the United States, which is rooted in the fact that it has invested in financial speculation instead of investing in, in its own industrial productivity, including all forms of industry, uh, including the so-called fourth industrial revolution. It has instead focused on short-term profits. At the same time, the leadership and the elite in the United States demonstrate a very limited understanding of the world in which they have immense power and at the same time, the nation is characterized by profound political divisions and ideological divisions, which render it incapable of responding constructively to any challenge that it confronts. As a result of its decadence, the United States began, uh, the signs of which particularly were evident since 1980, but uh, it became more and more apparent. And since 2014, Cuban scholars maintain, the United States has engaged in unconventional warfare against humanity as a whole, and particularly against uh, particular nations, such as Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, China, Russia, Iran, and Syria. The unconventional war is an effort to topple governments without the direct use of force. It includes such measures as economic sanctions, blocking trade and financial transactions. It includes uh, financial and ideological backing of opposition groups within the targeted country. It includes supplying arms to local fascist gangs it includes financing local destabilizing activities. It includes uh, enlisting the support of local 
NGOs in opposition to the government. It includes ideological distortions, which uh, have to do with a general frame of reference, a general distorted frame of reference, as well as distortions of concrete facts. And the dissemination of, of these ideological distortions through the mainstream media, as well as through the social media using paid so-called influencers. At the same time, the unconventional war counts on a, a military presence uh, in the region. So from that vantage point, uh, what I see and what Cuban scholars and political leaders see in the events in Ukraine is the, is the United States conducting unconventional war against Russia in Ukraine. And uh, from this perspective, we point out uh, various things such as the NATO expansion and expansionism. Uh, since 1997, NATO has added 14 countries of Eastern Europe. In addition, since 2014, non-governmental organizations have been active uh, in Ukraine, uh, Western non-governmental organizations uh, were active in 1914, transforming peaceful protests in, to create conditions for a right-wing coup d'etat. And since, uh, which, uh, which led to uh, a rebellion by the Russian speaking population in the more or less Southern and Eastern zones where they declared autonomous governments. Uh, a, a civil war broke out and there were agreements, the so-called Minsk Accords in uh, 2014 and 2015 that were not adhered to uh, by the government of Ukraine uh, nor by NATO. Uh, since uh, 2014, uh, there have been sustained bombings of the civilian population uh, of the Russian speaking uh, population in the Russian zones and there have been uh, fascist military uh, militias uh, occupying the Russian-speaking uh, zones. Uh, all of this uh, reached an acceleration in February. Uh, and uh, as a result of this history, the uh, uh, Cuban uh, government has taken the position that Russia has the right to defend itself against Western imperialist aggression. Uh, and as I mentioned, all of this was accelerated in February, prompting uh, Russia to launch a military operation that was designed to protect the Russian speaking population. Uh, it's, uh, this is often referred to as the denazification, that is to say the elimination of the fascist uh, militias in the Donbass area. It is also has the objective of the demilitarization uh, of, of Ukraine. And uh, at the same time, uh, there has been uh, going on a, a, a war of media in which the characterizations of the Western media are completely different from the characteristic uh, the characterizations that are going on uh, from uh, such outlets as in, in Russia and in Cuba and in Venezuela uh, concerning uh, civilian deaths as well as uh, concerning the effectiveness of the Russian military uh, uh, campaign. Now, um, I, I, I wanted to uh, move from here uh, uh, to uh, what from a, a Russian, uh, a, a Cuban point of view is uh, an alternative possibility to the neo-colonial world system and the imperialist policies of the, of the, the Western powers. Uh, recall that from their point of view, the neo-colonial world system is not sustainable. They see the emergence of an alternative uh, uh, pluripolar world. It is not a, a, a reconstruction of the bipolar world of the Cold War. It is the emergence of a different kind of pluripolarity that really has its roots in the third world. 
and, and it can be traced, for example, to the uh, conference of Bandung in 1955 and the subsequent emergence of the non-aligned movement, which suffered ideological setbacks in the 1980s and 1990s, but which uh, renewed and reestablished its initial ideological objectives, which was in the 21st century, which is particularly apparent in the summit of the Nine Aligned Movement in Havana in uh, 2006, uh, in which Cuba was serving as president for the second time of, of the Nine Aligned Movement. At that meeting, it became clear that the uh, representatives of the governments of the third world uh, completely rejected the neoliberal policies of the global powers, the imperialist policies of the global power, and continued to retake the classic formulation of the non-aligned movement toward the development of a different kind of world order, one that is not based on imperialist domination or on exploitation and super exploitation, but one that is based on cooperation among nations as the only possible foundation for uh, peace and prosperity in, in humanity. In it, now, in addition to the reemergence of the non-aligned movement in the beginning of the 21st century, uh, there also have been important signs for the emergence of an alternative uh, world order. There is the new political reality in Latin America, which expressed itself uh, really in the first uh, quarter of the 21st century. There is the rise of China, uh, in which it, it has ascended as a, a world power, but more than that, it has embraced in its foreign policy and its relations with other nations, the discourse of the non-aligned movement and the third world, and is seeking to cooperate with the nations of the world in the development of uh, cooperation among nations, mutually beneficial trade among nations uh, as the foundation for the future of humanity. Uh, Xi Jinping refers to this as a win-win uh, foreign policy. I see what is going on in, in Russia, and uh, uh, Cuban scholars in general see it this way, that uh, what, what Russia has done in recent years is to refine its anti-imperialist uh, uh, Soviet roots and to, um, and to join this global anti-imperialist movements in which China is playing a leading role and in which uh, a, a number of uh, third world uh, states are active part participants. And particularly important in this regard are precisely those nations that have been targeted in the unconventional war. Uh, nations like Cuba and Venezuela and Iran, unacceptable to the imperialist powers because of their refusal to accept the dictates uh, coming from, uh, from Washington. And at the same time, in addition to all of those developments occurring uh, in, the, uh, in, in the world as a whole, there is the reality of the decadence of imperialism, of its incapacity to respond to the challenges that uh, humanity uh, confronts. And that uh, uh, these uh, nations of the third world, particularly those that are seeking to construct socialism, give an emphasis on productivity, whereas uh, the, uh, the United States gives emphasis on financial speculation. And it therefore is not in a position uh, to uh, lead the world in the construction of a more viable uh, uh, world system. Now, uh, in, in addition, I would I, I want to note, I, I just have a couple minutes left, that uh, the, the prevailing uh, view uh, here in, in Cuba and in the kind of media outlets that we have contact with here in Cuba is that uh, the sanctions uh, against Russia really will not work, that, uh, that Russia has the capacity uh, uh, to uh, 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 make a certain degree of sacrifices, and at the same time, uh, it, it can turn to these, uh, this alternative world uh, that is developing, and that the, the sanctions will really accelerate 
this uh, process of an, uh, of an uh, uh, alternative world. It seemed to me that uh, for a long time, China was always a little bit diplomatic about what it was doing, uh, was uh, cooperating with the nations of the third world like uh, 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 Venezuela and, 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 and Cuba. And at the same time, we're saying, uh, we're, we, don't, we don't wanna have a fight with anybody. You know, we're not against the United States. In fact, we wanna cooperate with the United States. But what is happening now with the United States demanding that China join in the sanctions of Russia and China saying no, it is, it is becoming more and more apparent that uh, there are important actors in the world that have been for the past 20 to 40 years constructing an alternative <clears throat> world order. And the conduct of, 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 the, uh, of the imperialist powers uh, is, is something that is going to accelerate consci uh, consciousness and commitment uh, uh, to that uh, process, which of course is good news uh, for humanity. I find uh, somewhat perplexing in total, uh, all of this process, uh, the, the conduct of the European nations uh, that I, I would think that they would have a capacity to see that uh, they do not have an interest in aligning, its, aligning itself with the decadent imperialism of the United States, that they would have an interest either in developing some kind of multilateral imperialism or joining in the uh, uh, more cooperative world order in which China is playing a, a leading role. But it seems that Europe at this time has aligned itself with decadent imperialism, which uh, is, is not a wise thing uh, for them to do. Well, thank you. Those are the comments that I've prepared. Uh, th uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I, don't, I like China. I don't want to fight with anybody either. So uh, I, I send best wishes to all. <laughs> now the floor is your professor Ayum. Uh, thank you, Professor Mili. Uh, thank you, Professor Bird, and also thank you, Professor Adadka, uh, for your you know uh, excellent organization and also a uh, wonderful point. And here uh, I'm glad to hear uh, some unique comments actually from Cuba. Thank you, Professor McCovey. And I think I may have met uh, Professor Mahdi Shaliat, possibly in Pakistan uh, during a conference, if my memory is correct, I think several years ago, I'm not sure, but it sounds very familiar. Uh, okay, uh, today I think I will shorten my talk uh, by focusing on China-Russian relationship. And of course, uh, we have already Professor uh, Zadka and also Professor McCovey uh, discussed theoretical perspective and also international situation about this, you know, conflict, especially to locate the Russian-Ukraine conflict in this larger context. But I will look at basically the Chinese-Russian uh, relationship. I think a lot of academics, uh, scholars, uh, they really believe uh, China and Russia, they really try to form a kind of united front against imperialism. And I think I really you know, don't want to use the term here anti-imperialism by Russia or China. Basically, if you look at now, as Professor McCarvey mentioned, uh, China basically want to pursue a non-enemy non policy or no enemy policy, which means they really want to develop a relationship with especially the uh, United States, European Union, and Japan. Uh, this is not really about ideology. It's only purely about economy. So that's why when we talk about the broad impact of the Russian-Ukrainian war, I would like to focus on non-political, non-ideological aspect. And of course, we know this war really created a huge uh, impact uh, globally. Uh, from food to security, you know, from neighboring country to even as far as Middle East, uh, Latin America, uh, East Asia, uh, US, Japan. So that's why it's really a global impact. But when we think about the Russian Ukrainian war and its impact on China, we really have to think about the nature of Russian Chinese relationship. 
So first, I'd like to go over briefly the recent development in so-called strategic relationship uh, between Russia and China. Uh, first of all, I just tried to quote three uh, spokesperson, I think from February to today, uh, they try to define or clarify the relationship between Russia and China. Uh, first of all, um, February 1st, uh, one Chinese foreign uh, ministry official basically tried to uh, set up the tone of, of China-Russian relationship. And in a statement, uh, the Chinese official basically said, the Russian-Chinese relationship is a back-to-back -back strategic consultative relationship. So I think it's really clear here, the Chinese basically define this relationship, first of all, is as back-to-back. -back. Well, if you understand the Chinese, you really have to think about what does it mean? Because back-to-back -back simply means you try to defend each other from the back. You will not fight shoulder by shoulder against a common enemy. So that's very important. So here you have to say this is more like a defensive you know, cooperation. Uh, not really you know, against the common enemy, but actually against the enemy uh, we, your you know, mm -hmm. a friend, either partner China or Russia, when they have a war, China or Russia, they will not you know, attack each other. So this is remind me very much like you know, uh, Soviet uh, Nazi pact, I think in 1939, a very interesting uh, term uh, the Chinese used. Second, the Chinese define this relationship is more like a consultative relationship. It's not really strategic. It's not really like, you know, a treaty online. So it's more like consultation. It's more like discussion. So if we understand this statement, I think uh, it's really close to the uh, choose of you, I mean, uh, Russian Chinese relationship. Uh, second, I think the misunderstanding of Russian Chinese joint uh, statement on February 4th uh, is really, I mean, uh, mislead us to understand the consequences of Russian Ukrainian war on China. Uh, first of all, if you read Russian Chinese joint statement on February 4th, uh, you will see both countries, uh, they acted as a global power, uh, which I think is very much true as Professor McCarvey just mentioned, a Russian, or uh, Russia tried to perceive our uh, poetry itself as a global empire, try to revive itself as a global empire, Soviet. Uh, China basically tried to uh, revive uh, what they call rejuvenation, uh, basically revive the Chinese you know, dream or materialized Chinese dream. So that's why both countries acted as a global power to discuss all kinds of corporations uh, from Belt and the Road to uh, your Asia Economic Union. Uh, they talk about democracy, uh, which is not like Western democracy, it's a global human democracy. Uh, they talk about almost every continent from Africa to Arctic uh, to global development. And also, of course, uh, they talk about, especially, I think, uh, economic cooperation. So if you read this statement, we really don't see any rhetorics or terms like anti-imperialism, because I don't think China will you know, bind itself to Russia's anti-West position. Uh, that's very clear. So that's a second statement. And I think on February 5th, uh, there's another term uh, explained by a Chinese foreign ministry vice uh, minister, uh, Yue, uh, Yue Yuchen. Uh, he basically explained uh, what's the implication of this joint statement. And he used the term, uh, nowadays, if you read uh, US newspapers and other Western newspapers, they always quote it like, no limit. What does it mean? They said, oh, there's no limit in Russian Chinese relationship. Then many scholars, academics, analysts, especially in the US, they try to interpret no limit as uh, China and Russia. They will form kind of you know, anti-Western alliance, probably even military alliance. But here, if you understand the context in which the so-called no limit is used, it's basically about explanation of this joint uh, statement on February 4th. <clears throat> As I just explained, if you read 
this joint statement on February 4th is really comprehensive. It's really everything about everything. It's really about everywhere. So therefore, of course, in this sense, uh, Russian-Chinese relationship is really, you know, no limits, of course. So that's why it's nothing about, you know, military <coughs> alliance. It's nothing about anti-West. So that's why here, I think we really have to be careful when we read uh, Russian-Chinese statement or when we try to understand Russian-Chinese uh, uh, relationship. Now the war in Russia, uh, in the Russian and Ukraine war actually proved, uh, first of all, I would say uh, Russia, of course, tried to revive Soviet Union. But after several decades, of course, after independence of this 1990s, now Russia actually, to some extent, is a pseudo power. If you look at the military, you know, uh, tactics, if you look at uh, weaponries, if you look at logistics support. So Russia is not really Soviet, and Russia is not really like a, a global power or superpower. So nowadays, we really have to fa uh, face the reality mm -hmm. that Russia is basically a regional power. Uh, you really cannot, you know, capture Ukraine or you really cannot uh, attempt to attack Baltic countries or well, even uh, Poland, even think about uh, they are basically a member of NATO. So that's why here we have to talk about the consequences, the impact of this war, especially on China. I'd like to talk about four areas. Uh, the first area is the Taiwan Strait. Uh, most of the scholars always compare the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war to Chinese-Taiwanese war. And of course, now you can imagine, when Russia uh, to today or uh, to these days, has been basically prevented in Ukraine uh, in terms of military you know, progression uh, or something. So that's why, as I said, now Russia basically is kind of pseudo power. So what's the implication on China? I think now Chinese basically changed their tone on the Taiwan Strait. And if you look at some uh, domestic and even cross the street politics, uh, for example, Chinese released a Taiwanese guy from the jail to show a kind of you know gesture to the Taiwanese. Uh, China reduced the military in you know, uh, a threat, if you will, to send more you know uh, airplanes to Taiwan Street. They basically try to you know reduce the tension. This is a very clear signal that China will not quickly, at least, will not follow the Russian military approach, at least in a possible you know future to either occupy or liberate Taiwan. So I think to some extent, the Russian-Ukraine war actually a weak, uh, a weak in the Chinese uh, to think about uh, seriously about the military uh, solution and consequences. Can you simply occupy, uh, can you simply occupy Taiwan or what, you know, what's your real military capacity? So that's a big uh, impact on Taiwan Street. So I think Taiwan Street in the coming decades will be relatively peaceful. And here, the United States, as we see recently, sent all these congressmen to visit Taiwan. On the one hand, of course, you can imagine, <clears throat> US also realized <clears throat> in the Taiwan Strait will be peaceful, but they try to provoke. So that's why you really have to be, uh, for the Chinese, uh, have kind of strategic patience. That's the first uh, impact I would see on Taiwan Street. Our second one is more like international standing or influence. As I mentioned, Russia is proved to be a pseudo power. Now, how about China? And of course, uh, Professor McCarvey just mentioned China tried to form kind of, you know, our third world alliance with Cuba, Iran, and other countries. True. I would say economically, if you look at the Belt and the Road Initiative, if you look at other, you know, areas of cooperation, but in terms of counter the West, counter the United States, I don't really believe uh, China will stand with other countries, no matter with Iran, uh, with Cuba, even today with Russia, because when United States threat Chinese not to provide weapons, of course, China even cut off in you know, a banking system with uh, Russia. So that's a very clear indicators. Mm -hmm. And Chinese try to avoid the damage of international reputation. Uh, they already realized because by supporting uh, Russia rhetorically or economically, uh, you basically uh, lose some kind of influence among many countries, but especially uh, you begin to suffer economically. 
So that's what Chinese learned the lessons uh, from previously, you know, several cases, especially like an IT company. So that's when now they're very much careful not to offend the West and not to, you know, offend the US. And of course, uh, theoretically, rhetorically, they still say Russia is important, we will cooperate, but the condition is there is a limit. The limit is they will not sacrifice the relationship with the West. The next one I'd like to talk about the impact on regional influence. And of course, after Russia invaded Ukraine, now we see China's neighbor country, especially South Korea, uh, Japan, even Southeast Asia, uh, they slightly changed their position towards the United States. South Korea recently, the newly elected president clearly expressed you know, a uh, desire to deepen a relationship with the United States. Uh, Japan's rearmament uh, is unavoidable, just like uh, Germany now. And of course, Southeast Asia or ASEAN, they basically try to strengthen their own military capacity if you look at several countries. So I think for China, of course, just like Russia, uh, your neighboring relationship, your you know, neighboring regions, and they basically slightly change uh, position. The last one I'd like to talk about the impact on domestic Chinese politics. When we talk about Russian Chinese relationship, we always look at international relationship or bilateral relationship. But if you look at the Ukrainian Russian war on domestic politics of China, you really have to think about what happened when Joseph Stalin died, where you have Khrushchev, you have a de Stalinization. Then, of course, in China, we say in front late 1950s, uh, you have all kinds of you know, political campaigns, movement, because the Soviet big brother, right? You have policy change. So now I think for the Chinese, on the one hand, the Chinese leaders really worry about it because you claim to be, you know, close friend of Putin. But now, of course, Russian suffered, Putin is isolated or possibly, you know, sanctioned and possibly, you know, even targeted as war criminal. So that's why I think for the Chinese leaders, now it's a really critical time uh, to tighten the control of Chinese society uh, to make sure that. China will not repeat what Russia has already, you know, suffered. So that's why in these four areas, I would say the Ukrainian-Russian <laughs> war really exerted a huge impact on China, both internationally, uh, in the Taiwan Strait, in neighboring countries, and even on domestic Chinese uh, policies. So that's why we try to understand, especially the Chinese COVID policy. Uh, a lot of scholars ask me why China still, you know, locked it down other cities. Well, this is not really simply about you know biological or what medical issue. This is really also about political issue. Especially you have to think about what happened in Russia nowadays, what happened in Eastern Europe. If you don't tighten the control of society, then you can imagine if you have kind of you know anti-Russian movement in China, you will basically repeat what happened in 1950s when you have a D Stalinization, then Chinese senior leaders will worry about what will happen, you know, all these young generations possibly will oppose uh, Chinese Stalin. So now we basically see the similar development. So that's the reason I think a Chinese really control, you know, a tighten the control of our society. Uh, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you for your patience and to Professor Midi. Uh, I think, uh, as I told you, I stay in a hotel and I have to check out earlier. So I'm afraid I will leave earlier today. Now we go to Professor Michael Kuhn. Please, the floor is yours. So my presentation is entirely different from what has been said so far. Um, I am not uh, participating in, a de in the debate looking at the world through the different perspective of nation states, may this be China, may this be Russia, maybe the, the European Union, uh, not to mention the um, United States, uh, states uh, the colleague uh, from Cuba um, mentioned before. My point of view is an entirely different one. My point of view is this. Firstly, it is not even 
hundred years ago that the world war number two was ended. It ended with the United States of the world as the nation state, which had the power over the world. The war destroyed Europe. It destroyed millions of people's life on all sides. Again, this is not 100 years ago. Today, we are facing in the war at the moment carried out between Russia and the Ukraine, most obviously world war number three. Why this war happened can be explained to my mind very easily. Uh, the, uh, uh, some colleagues before already mentioned this. To briefly summarize it, the conflict is about this. The United States, together with the European Union, all joined in the NATO, claim to rule the world of nation states. There is nobody else they accept who has a word in how the nation states are related to each other. That is decided in Washington. With the support of the allies in the NATO. Russia is from this point of view a challenge and it has become an even bigger challenge for the West after the Soviet Union project was terminated. I use this word terminated because I consider the notion of the collapse as a Western way of interpreting this. But this is a long other debate. I don't want to talk about this now, but I just want to mention this. Russia, uh, excuse me, the Soviet Union has been transformed in to a capitalist economy. It was a capitalist country, sorry. It was opposing before. The reason for this is a long story. For the West, the problem was that the Soviet Union joined capitalism, but it still had the weapons to be a world power. Secondly, having become a capitalist country, Russia detected its desire to also become a world power. This is not accepted by the West. The start of the war was very, uh, can also be to my mind very easily explained. The West tried via its move and encirclement of it moved to the east in Europe and its encirclement in other parts of the world to arrive finally via uh, conquering the Ukraine as the president of the of Russia Putin said uh, dancing on the fence of Russia that was somehow his words having faced this Russia approached the West and said in a diplomatic note, very clearly, we don't accept this anymore. We want you to withdraw your military forces towards the status as it was, I think it was 19, 1998, with certain details that uh, uh, the Ukraine should become a neutral country. Uh, uh, the weapons the NATO has um, dislocated, 
uh, when they were uh, moving towards the east in countries have to be withdrawn, etc., etc. In short, Russia wanted the West to reduce its ability to threaten Russia in a military in a, in a, in a way that Russia had no chance in a war against the West. So Russia said, we don't accept this anymore. And we ask you to negotiate about this. We have to find another relation between the West and Russia. The reaction of the West was, they ignored that. They ignored it by saying, we can talk about anything, but what you want to talk about is no topic for us. It was a very, diplomatically speaking, a very rude way to reject Russia's request to be accepted by the West as a competing global power. With the reason that the West said, there is only one global power, that is the West. The next step was, as Russia has announced it, they started the war. They started the war against the Ukraine. And as some colleagues said before, of course, the war in the Ukraine is not a war between Russia and the Ukraine, but it is a war between Russia and the West. And the Ukraine is playing the role of uh, um, fighting sort of the first fight uh, against Russia. And as the West is very often doing it, the best example is Syria, they don't waste their military forces, especially don't, they don't waste their uh, uh, soldiers. They let other people carry out uh, their wars uh, until they intervene or until they are successful with this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They, this uh, strategy is very well known. So this war is not a war between the Ukraine and Russia, but it is a war between the Ukraine and the West. And the Ukraine um, is uh, uh, silly enough to play the role of a kind of uh, country that carries out the political aims of the West. But of course, that's what the Ukraine has been prepared for since the last uh, couple of years, since uh, the uh, political elites in the Ukraine took over the power exactly for this purpose. The result of this is, the result of this, the ignorance of the suggestion of Russia to negotiate about a new relation between the West and Russia, Russia claiming also playing the role of a world power and negotiating this and the rejection of this and the war started in the Ukraine and the, the war uh, in the Ukraine, as I said, as a war between, the, between Russia and the West, this war happens and it happens in a way that the West again is continuously rejecting all the interventions of Russia, telling them that they should not participate in the war in the Ukraine. But the West does it and it does it massively. And it does it only not in a military way by, by, by sending uh, weapons, etc., uh, etc., et to the Ukraine, but also by accompanying this war in the Ukraine with all kind of uh, economic sanctions, which aim at destroying the economic infrastructure of Russia. So while the, while the weapons uh, speak in the Ukraine, the West accompanies or uh, accomplishes this military part of the war with another part of the war aiming at the destruction of the Russian infrastructure of the Russian economy. I just, now, just a couple of minutes before we started, I read an interview with the, uh, um, with the uh, president of the Europe, what is it called? Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what her title is, sorry, with the, 
uh, von der Leyen, she's German, she is the current uh, head of the European Union, and she said, uh, you can be sure, she was asked by journalists, and she said, you can be sure, in a couple of weeks, the Russian economy will collapse and be entirely destroyed thanks to the uh, sanctions, economic sanctions uh, we uh, put on them. The consequence of this is that considering that Russia has said if the war, if the West intervenes into this war, we have to, we are prepared to also use our nuclear weapons. We are not so far away from, uh, from this point anymore that Russia will use, make the next step and will use nuclear weapons if this happens, but it can also happen in another way. For example, that Russia decides that they no longer accept the transport of all the military material into the Ukraine and destroy these uh, military uh, transports uh, inside or outside of the borders of the Ukraine, which means in Bulgaria, in Poland, or wherever, then we have the case that the NATO is involved, and then we have World War number three. Again, this is not more, this is not even 100 years ago after World War II ended. That is the situation. Moreover, as you all know, this is the war that happens now in Europe, and it is not only the same kind of war we had before, but as I tried to say, it is a war that will sooner or later continue to become World War III. But this is not all. Within these hundred years, less than hundred years history after World War II, the world was a world of war. I don't know any continent in which there was not a war. And in all these wars, the West was not only involved, but was the one who started these wars. In the context of this group, it's uh, not necessary that I start to enumerate now uh, all the wars ending up in Afghanistan, uh, which was, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the last one. Uh, and the numerous wars before, uh, several of them were mentioned in some of the other presentations by you before. Unlike the presentations, the considerations you make when you think about this situation, the question I raise is a totally different one. The question I raise is the following one. Number one, my observation is, and this sounds almost redundant. My question is, what are all these wars? What are wars in this world? And what I say sounds really utterly simplistic. Wars are conflicts carried out by a particular subject. And the subjects are nation states. You might say, well, of course, what else? But my question now is, if it is the case that the subject of all these wars happening since World War II, I'm, I didn't even talk about the time before World War II, I'm only talking about the time after World War II, and especially now about the situation today with the uh, World War III uh, not so far away anymore from us. Looking at this, 
stating that the subject of wars are nation states. My point is that I think it is time to raise the question, what is the relation of nation states and war? My statement would be this one, and I have to prove this. And this is the contribution I want to make this, to this discussion, stating or reflecting on the question why wars are a genuine element of nation states and the nation state relations. In other words, I want to find out and I suggest seriously to think about that, not to accept that wars are just part of human life or anything like that, but to seriously think about this relation that the subjects of the wars the world is facing since 100 years after World War II with millions of dead people I want to suggest to raise the question, what is the relation between nation states and war? And not accept this as a kind of natural things that happened uh, in uh, human life every now and then. To think about this question, what is the relation between nation states and war? I want to make, I want to suggest just uh, a kind of, I have to make a kind of uh, pre, uh, some preliminary, two uh, or three preliminary remarks. Firstly, the world we live in, the world we live in now, I have to be more precisely, is a world of the very same nation states. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, as I mentioned already before, when I was discussing uh, why uh, Russia detects its interest in become an imperialist uh, country or a country playing a major role in the world, uh, questioning the uh, uh, exclusive uh, world power of the United States. Firstly, uh, Russia is a country that, due to the return of the Soviet Union to a capitalist society, has contributed to the fact that the world consists of everywhere the same nation states, the same nation states with capitalist societies. There is another historical uh, fact that needs to be mentioned. The colonies, the colonies, remember, which were fighting against the colonialists, those colonialists, which were all capitalist countries, the colonies as well have become what? Capitalist societies, capitalist societies in a, in a, certainly in a different way than the uh, sort of uh, uh, original capitalist societies like the Europeans and the United States, but they have become capitalist societies. They have become societies with nation states and a market economy. This means, and this is what happened after World War II, this means that in fact, the whole world is now consisting of the same society model. Uh, this, and this is the reality of the world of nation states that had, has had an influence on how we are seeing the world. And the influence is that it, takes, it is taken as a most natural thing that the world society consists of capitalist societies. And it has resulted in another uh, 
let's say, uh, it, theoretical drama, it has resulted in naturalizing the nation states as the natural way of organizing mankind's life. My point is, though this sounds thanks to the fact that the world has become a world consisting of the same society model, that is of nation states running a market economy, seemingly being the natural way to organize human's life on the earth. This is what we should not accept as the nature of mankind. And I think it is the mission or the job or the duty of scientific thinking to look behind such naturalizations of a socially made reality. Now let me let me uh, continue a little bit, and you can see what I'm saying is uh, quite uh, are quite uh, sort of uh, drafted ideas uh, that I'm uh, working on. Uh, how do you say inspired by the uh, situation as I described it? Let me try uh, to uh, say something. Mike, we have just. Yes? Five more minutes. Yeah, it Five is okay. Yeah, 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 it is okay. In my, it, it's okay. Thank you. It's okay. You, you, you are, you're right to warn me because uh, I, could, I could now start a presentation for which I would need five hours, in fact. Uh, so what I now want to suggest is that we have to start to think about the re interrelations between nation states and wars. And I don't want to start uh, to uh, do this here because I, in fact, I have no time for that. I just want to point, uh, to use my last five minutes to point on uh, some uh, um, challenge doing such kind of reflections, raising the questions what the relation between war and nation states is. And as I said, my uh, hypothesis is that Wars are a genuine means of the relations between nation states. And if this is the case, to clear that, say that clearly, the conclusion is that rather than thinking about how nation states relate to each other, the conclusion is that we must get rid of a world ruled by nation states because a world ruled by nation states is a world that includes wars. Let me point finally on uh, some um, difficulties, challenges, problems, reflecting on this topic, the relation between nation states and war. There are two historical theoretical dramas, to my mind, in the critique of capitalism. And this drama is that from the beginning of Marx theory, for example, the nation state has not been a topic in the Marxist critique of capitalism. It has always been a critique of the economy and to the worse, it was the Russian communists, the Russian anti-capitalists, who even changed their view on the nation state dramatically. You re all remember, it was a certain man called Lenin who said, the state is the political body of capitalism. And in the, in the, how do you say, in the development of developing socialism, the state will die. And we have to create other political bodies than, than nation states. As you know, then the war 
uh, be, uh, between Russia and Germany starts, or Germany started the war against Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, sorry. In this war, it happened that the Russian anti-capitalists changed their view on the nation state entirely with the result that the nation state became the revolutionary subject of anti-capitalism. The nation state became in the theory of the historical materialism, a project of the progress of civilization. This, this theory of anti-capitalism, this theory of critiquing capitalism, glorifying the nation state as the final uh, revolutionary subject of anti-capitalism is a theory which has invaded thinking about the nation state massively across all the social science discipline. And thinking about the nation state today and the relation of war has to, has to trouble with this anti-capitalist theory, glorifying the nation state, which Lenin once says has to die because it's the political body of capitalism. There is another historical drama. And with this, I come to the end just to outline what are the difficulties we are facing if you think about the relation between war and, and uh, a nation state. The historical drama number two is the transformation of the colonies towards nation states and the construction of nation states were considered by the colonies. And this is a major part of the world of nation states. This applies to the whole Africa. It applies to the whole Latin America. It applies to Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. In these countries, which have been transformed from colonies towards nation states, they call them independent nation states. This transformation considers until today, the nation state, the political body of capitalism as a neutral political body that is open to all kinds of policy agendas. Even the nation state is an optional body seen as a step towards overcoming capitalism. To conclude, mm -hmm. next to the normal other still existing mystifications of war and nation states, we can all find across all the social sciences. Uh, I, I could make another presentation about this here. I don't do it. Thinking about the relation between nation state and war is troubled, has the theoretical burden to overcome, to critically reflect on the knowledge the anti-capitalist theories have about the nation state. And my hypothesis is this, the fact that it was the historical materialism and the people in the colonies who were even celebrating the nation state as a potential in the case of the colonies or as a real revolutionary subject, this has resulted in excluding the nation state from the critique of capitalism. And as an implication, the nation state as the subject, as that what causes wars. And if I could have time now, I would continue and try to prove why the nation state is the reason for all the wars. The concept of nation states is the reason for the war. That's what I have to prove. Finished. Thank you very much, Mike. We will, we will wait for your full paper when we will publish the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now the floor is yours, Professor Dustin Jaber. All right, very good. Good to be with everybody today. 
Um, as a political philosopher, one of the things that I think I can best contribute to this discourse is through an, an analysis of the political philosophy of the current Kremlin. Um, it becomes very clear that, uh, especially in the West, people aren't sure exactly what the uh, political ideology of the Kremlin is at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. The Russian constitution does not allow for an official ideology, but there is a prevailing ideology in the Kremlin without a doubt. Um, my journey into this study of this began really in, in, in 2015, 2016. Not that I'm unfamiliar with Russia and Ukraine. I traveled to Ukraine from 2003 to 2013 numerous times, spent a lot of time there. Um, but in 2015, 2016 is when in the U.S. we started to see a lot of Russian involvement uh, in the, the election uh, in order to uh, support the candidate Donald Trump for president. And, and of course, it has come out in, in numerous, numerous publications, the long and extensive relationship that Donald Trump had with the Kremlin going back all the way to the 80s when it was still the Soviet Union. So I officially began my, this study when I found myself in Charlottesville in 2017, Charlottesville, Virginia, during the Unite the Right rally, where all the neo-Nazis, the alt-right, the Klan, all of them showed up for a great rally. I didn't go there for that, but I found myself there during that. So alongside of the chants that Jews will not replace us, they also chanted, Russia is our friend. Over and over and over again, the night of the Tiki Torch neo-Nazi parade, Russia is our friend and Jews will not replace us, which coming from a background of uh, predominantly in Germany, I, why would they think Russia is their friend? And I had to dig into that a little bit more. Um, and of course, as I were studying um, to write a book on alternative forms of fascism, what I kept coming across over and over and over again from intellectuals in the neo-fascist movement is Alexander Dugin, precisely the person that uh, Alexander talked about here earlier. Over and over and over again, there was an appeal to the work of Alexander Dugin, who was oftentimes called Putin's brain, Putin's Rasputin, Putin's favorite fascist philosopher. Uh, and so, of course, I bought as many books by Alexander Dugan as I could. And unfortunately, all of that money goes to Arctos Media, Arctos Press, which is a far right neo fascist uh, publishing house. It's the largest uh, distributor of alt right and, and neo fascist uh, works in the West, based in London. And it's run by a, a Swede named Daniel Freiburg. Um, and all of uh, Alexander Dugan's or most of Alexander Dugan's books published in the West are published by this far right publishing house. As you know, Alexander Dugan is the progenitor of neo Eurasianism. Uh, it's not the same as the old school Russian Eurasianism. It takes uh, a whole lot of other influences into itself in order to produce a neo uh, new form of Eurasianism. Uh, as you know, most likely that uh, Alexander Dugan has called for the reintegration of Ukraine back into Russia for decades, but not only Ukraine, as Alexander has already brought up, but also the Baltic states, also post-Soviet states, also Central Asia. And when he has his wettest of wet dreams, he says from uh, Dublin to Vladivostok. <laughs> Right. This is the, the ultimate dream of Alexander Dugan. Of course, I don't think it's the dream that Putin has, but uh, he's certainly influenced by this. So when you shake Putin, out falls Alexander Dugan. When you shake Alexander Dugan, out comes all these different influences. And of course, the first one is probably traditional uh, Russian Eurasianism, which grew up in the early 20th century, in many cases as a reaction to the Soviet Union. Uh, these are the writings uh, by Prince Nikolai Trubetskoy, Peter Savitsky, Peter Suvchinsky, uh, George Forovsky, and behind them, Nikolai Danilevsky. And he was the one who really developed this idea of Eurasia, that Russia is not Europe or Western, but its own civilization. From the, the, the Western Slavs all the way to Vladivostok, it is its own civilization. And even those territories where you find millions of Russians as a minority that also belongs to that Eurasian civilization. 
be, next to him, you have Lev Gumilev, and he's the ideology of this, this what he called passion or nost, which is a neologism of passio in Latin to narost in, in Russian, which is the capacity for suffering in the quest for massive change, uh, the capacity for a civilization to sacrifice itself for a different tomorrow and not necessarily a better tomorrow, right? So Lev Gumilev is very much influential in there. There's also Orthodox theology that is influential with Alexander Dugin. Uh, Berdeyev's, especially his concept of the new middle ages, which is a pre-modern value, is values and identity in a modern world, oftentimes called political, by political philosophers, reactionary modernism. Uh, it's the marriage of the Orthodox church to the state, right, which of course is uh, attacked by the, the liberal revolutions, right, where the separation of church and state. We see this, of course, with Patriarch Kirill blessing the, the war in Ukraine to the point where patriarchs, uh, Orthodox patriarchs around the world are, want him to be either sanctioned or defrocked uh, for the blessing of the, the slaughter in Ukraine. Uh, they're calling it a form of Constantinian Christianity, again, uh, with Emperor Constantine in the fourth century when Christianity combines with the power of the empire. Now it blesses the mass killing and the slaughter. Um, you can also see the influence of the Orthodox Church with Russia's anti-LGBTQ policies, right, mm -hmm. uh, where sexual minorities are, are very much uh, persecuted within the Russo sphere. You also see this uh, influence in Dugin and into the Kremlin of traditionalism We're coming out of Reginon. René Guinon, of course, is the progenitor of perennialism, which is a need, uh, perennialism, the idea that all religious faiths somehow sacred are sacred they're all legitimate if they have this ancient core to them certainly not new modern age face but the ancient ones this is especially important for dugan's idea of of this um civilization to be a unified civilization because um that because it is a multi-confessional uh civilization because multi-ethnic civilization russia obviously is not just the rus Right? It's many other people, and if it was just the Rus, just Orthodox, it would be much smaller than what it is today, and of course could not even attempt to be an empire. Behind uh, the traditionalism, you have Ivan Ilyin, this Russian philo fascist philosopher who was uh, thrown out of the Soviet Union. Uh, Putin himself intervened in 2006 at my university, Michigan State University. Uh, to have all of Ivan Ilyin's documents repatriated back to Russia because he had become very much a reader and a follower of Ivan Ilyin. And now he quotes Ivan Ilyin constantly in his speeches. It happened to be that uh, during the Soviet Union, fascist philosophy wasn't in, in vogue, obviously. And so uh, a, a professor at Michigan State University uh, was contacted by the family of Ivan Ilyin and his literary estate was moved to Lansing, Michigan, where it is now patriot back to Moscow State University on the order of Vladimir Putin, a fascist philosopher, his, one of his favorites. If you push back into the influence of Alexander Dugan, you also find, of course, Martin Heidegger, uh, especially his ideology of Eigenslichkeit, which comes out of Sein und Zeit, being in time, this idea of uh, authenticity and uneigenslichkeit, the non-authentic, and that uh, Russia now has to become eigenslichkeit. It has to be reconciled with its own roots. It cannot be cosmopolitan like the West. It cannot be liberal like the West. It cannot allow for sexual deviancy, but has to return back to its cultural roots, which is very similar to what you saw in the Third Reich. Uh, you have Carl Schmitt, same, he pops up, of course, Carl Schmitt in, in all the writings of Alexander Dugan. The very uh, interesting, the katakon, this old Greek idea that comes from the Gospels, that somehow there is something among the Christian community that restrains the coming of the Antichrist. Dugan believes today, he's been politicized, it. he turns it into Russia is the katakon, that which restrains the incoming of the Antichrist. So therefore, Russia is only the only force in the world that stops the end of the world, that stops the Antichrist from coming. Um, and so you have a political theologization, political theologization of, of this term. And then also among uh, the traditional German fascists, you have Karl Haushofer. 
uh, which I'm sure Alexander knows a lot about. He is considered the, the father of Nazi geopolitics. He was the uh, one who coined the concept of Leven's realm, for instance. Um, he very much shows up in Dugan's book, The Foundations of Geopolitics. In fact, you could even say he takes uh, Karl Hofer's thesis and applies it from Germany to Russia. In the 1980s, of course, as uh, liberalization started to, or the Soviet Union started to liberalize a little bit, this is when Dugan was able to go to France and meet one of his intellectual interlocutors, Alain de Benoit, very famous French intellectual who gives fascist ideas an air of intellectual respectability, um, fascist philosophy without a Holocaust, if you will, uh, xenophobia without racism. Um, this is his, his shtick, his deal, even though Hélène uh, de Benoit and oftentimes uh, pushes back on Dugan. Dugan has learned a lot from Hélène uh, de Benoit. All of this together creates a, a palingenetic form of nationalism, which scholars of fascism tell us is the absolute core of fascism. Palingenesis, the idea of rejuvenation, return like the phoenix, uh, the resurrection, Anastasia, which is today Easter, right, in here in the West or whatever. Um, but uh, the return on the basis of a nation. Now, the nation, of course, in the Russian sense is not an ethnic nation. It is not a, a Volksgemeinschaft, if you will, right, uh, a nation state. It is a, an imperial Willensgemeinschaft, an imperial willed people, right, that are somehow connected through, uh, specifically through language, um, not so much through culture, but uh, intensely through language. Now, Dugan calls this theory that he has developed based on these influences, the fourth political theory. It's not liberalism, it's not communism, it's not fascism, but a new political theory that is neither right nor left. Now, any good scholar of fascism looks at this and says, this is clearly not true, right? Because he mixes up a genus with a species, right? This is a different, it's not a different genus of political philosophy that he has created. It's a different species of a very particular genus and that genus is fascism. It is fascism Russian style. Uh, it is the essence of uh, what we have in, in, in with Dugan's political philosophy. Now, what's his influence on Putin? A lot of people ask that question constantly, you know, does Putin have meetings with Dugan or something like this? And they have met in the past. Um, and our brother, dear brother, Sayyid Javad Mary has met Alexander Dugan as well. Um, it is not the case that that Putin has meetings with Dugan as if he goes there and says, what should I do next or anything like this? No more so than neoconservatives were meeting with Leo Strauss, you know, in the University of Chicago saying, where do we invade next? Right. But the fact is, is that Dugan's uh, neo-Eurasianist political philosophy is the dominant political philosophy in the Kremlin at the time. Um, and so in this sense, this, this challenge to uh, the bad liberalism, neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal hegemony that you have is not a challenge from the left. It is a challenge from the right. That's what I think is missing in a lot of people's understanding of the very political philosophy that we're dealing with in the world. We all know the horrible nature of neoliberalism, and it's an order where it has created benefits and winners for some people and a whole lot of losers for other people. There is no doubt about it, but this is not a challenge from a leftist who wants to bring universal socialism to the world and bring people better health care and better education. This is a challenge from the right to the, to the neoliberal hegemony. And there is nothing to say that it would be better to go farther to the right globally uh, than it would be. Uh, so, what do we have here? Dugan's goals, rebirth of the Russian empire, which means the rebirth of the Russian civilization as a civilization, it's palingenesis and it's multipolarity on the right, right? It's a reintegration of all former Soviet republics back into a newly reconstituted Russian empire. That is his dream. He's been very clear about that and has projected that for decades. It's not a return to the Soviet Union, at least not ideologically. It is a return to the Soviet Union's borders, right? 
Um, Russia alone, obviously, cannot be a countervailing pole in a multipolar world. It doesn't have the strength, the economic strength, the military power to rival the US, the EU, and NATO. It is not the second best military in the world. At the moment, it is the second best military in Ukraine. Right? That's all it is. It has an economic power of the state of California. Now, that's large for American state. <laughs> But that's not large for something that's a supposedly a superpower. And as our other speaker suggested, it's simply a regional power uh, and not a superpower at all. Right? <laughs> now, with this in mind, all of this talk of Ukraine being a Nazi state is pure ideology, pure ideology. Right? The Azov Battalion certainly exists. No doubt about it. It started as a right-wing neo-Nazi group in 2014 in the Euro Maidan. You could see them running around uh, the, the the Maidan in Kiev. No doubt about it. The uh, leader Andrei Bilitsky of the of the Azov Battalion started the Azov Battalion as a far-right neo-nationalist movement fighting Russia. No doubt, right. Uh, nevertheless, in the meantime, it has been absorbed into the Ukrainian National Guard. It has lost its ideological component there, although it is very clear, and they've been very clear about it, there are still white nationalists in the Azov Battalion. However, estimates are about 900 people in total. 900, right? In the last election in 2019 uh, in Ukraine, the uh, far right groups, the far right movements, got 2% of the vote, which means they didn't even make it out of the first round of elections. They have no seats in the parliament, right? Zelensky is far from being a conservative. He's far from being a nationalist. He is a liberal comedian turned politician, right? Um, does he use the Azov Battalion in the East to fight against Russian incursions? Absolutely, no doubt about it, that we can't escape. But uh, the idea that this Jewish guy, descendants of, uh, you know, of a, a grandfather who fought in the, the great patriotic war against actual Nazis has become a Nazi himself is absolutely absurd. And this idea has been thrown out and criticized by Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum scholars throughout the world. Right? However, last point, what will end this war? Unfortunately, the same thing that ended the Vietnam War, a lot of dead soldiers. And that is the horrible nature of this war, especially when you have a leader who's thinking historically, what's his place in history? How is he gonna reconstitute this world historical power? Unfortunately, that is what's gonna end the war. I think, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I, unfortunately I think I, that will do it. Um, yeah, I'll end it with that. Okay. Thank you very much, Dustin was a great presentation. Now the floor is yours, Mehdi. You know, I, I don't know if I have much to add to what has been said already. I think I, starting with Alexander um, in California with um, uh, references to Heartland and um, McKinder. And of course, I have a few things to add to that. And then, of course, um, I believe it was uh, Charles. Uh, and then, of course, the wrath of new liberalism, um, which, um, you know, in Latin America in particular, of course, it wreaked havoc. I have a paper on that, by the way. It's called The Wrath of New Liberalism. Um, and, um, and Michael's uh, notion of concepts of nation and state, I believe. Uh, if I understood you right, you were hinting at that we really look, have to look at the nation state as a unit of analysis rather than empire and region. I, I don't know if I understood you right. And, um, and Dustin, of course, um, did a terrific job with respect to Dugan because I have a few things on Dugan and the uh, Eurasianism before even it confronted Atlanticism. Uh, Eurasianism, of course, goes back to 19th century, uh, Constant, uh, Constantine uh, Leontief, I think. And before that, it was, um, I forgot his name. Uh, a friend of mine mentioned that, and I thought I just mentioned him. It seems like a, 
there is a link between early Eurasianness and socialism or sort of a communal life in Russia, which is very interesting that really socialism wasn't anything, um, you know, un unusual or, or unfamiliar to most uh, Russians. Um, Alexander Herzen, of course, that was an early part of the uh, 19th century. Um, who really was, was credited with predicting social revolutions all over the uh, uh, Slavic world. Um, so my paper has, um, but anyway, so I, like I said, it seems like I have just about um, references to everything you've said so far. Uh, my paper has four parts and the title of it is, I thought, um, that should say something about what follows. And the title is Empires, Imperialism, and the Geopolitical Economy. Geopolitical <laughs> Economy, not just political economy, but geopolitical economy, and not just geopolitics, but geopolitical economy that has become very um, popular these days. So it's Empire, Imperialism, and the geopolitical economy of Eurasia. The subtitle, of course, is Helplessness and Agony in Witnessing Atavism. Helplessness and Agony in Witnessing Agonism. And my point in this whole paper is that, um, that let's not zoom in Ukraine because sadly, this is the history of human beings ever since we organized political states ever since we formed political entities, whether in the form of empires or later on in the form of nation and states. So obviously I have to start with what perhaps one of the most violent encounters between cultures and that is of course colonialism. And in particular, I zoom on the two centuries that colonialism really, particularly after the industrial revolution that, that colonialism uh, was rampant all over the world and without impunity, without anybody to stop them, except the interest of other colonial empires that maybe would encroach on their territory, somehow they do have to do something about it. And um, from the Industrial Revolution, we see the race for resources. I borrowed that from Michael Tanzer, who has a book with that name back in the 1970s, or 60s, I believe. Race for resources. And justification of colonialism. Today, it still lingers on. We heard about Dugan. Dugan is a racist SOB. I mean, the comments that he makes, the, the, the language that he uses against other people is nothing new, really, in the context of an empire. Um, justification of colonialism, of course, as we all know, uh, included race, religion, civilizing mission. Civilizing mission representative of, of, of one of the czars of Russia also really claimed that humanity needs Russia, the same way that Victor Hugo claimed that, you know, France is really needed by humanity and we have to preserve France. Social sciences, uh, which prostituted themselves uh, in the service of the empire instead of standing against based on the the, the commitment that, that science is supposed to have in, ser in search of truth, social science began to prostituting themselves and opening up fields that were not known to the say, statesmen of these colonial empires. Sociology, eugenics, political economy, uh, really inherited things from the enlightenment philosophers the view of others, this otherness that is started in many ways by some of the philosophers in enlightenment. Uh, horrible things that they had to say about the Chinese, about the Indians, about the Africans, mm -hmm. and the racial hierarchy that evolved. Categories from the Caucasian mm -hmm. to Mongoloids to Negroids, socially constructed. And on that basis, they receive a certain kind of treatment. So the Caucasians didn't receive as much really. For instance, the working class in Manchester, England, which was considered, some of them considered to be of the lower race even because of their occupation, because of their lack of access to resources and the treatment of the Irish. 
And then, of course, the Mongoloids, the Chinese, or the, or the Asian people, the concept of yellow, yellow, yellow prill uh, that facilitated uh, treatments and also, of course, ultimately opening up the door to uh, naval um, bombardment of, of China, China's coastal cities. So here we have a multipolar system. The colonial era is a multipolar system, multipolarity. These individuals have divided the world amongst themselves. And of course, in the process, we have winners and losers, the multipolar system. This is the same period, by the way, that Napoleon started his, his invasion of Russia. This is what geography becomes relevant. Again, to look at Mackinder and even, you know, I'm kind of surprised that the uh, if the, uh, surprised that they didn't have anybody then to tell them, hey, the train is really not suitable. Even though the guy took six hundred thousand soldiers, only a hundred thousand returned. He lost half a million soldiers in Russia, froze to death because of the landscape. And he, in many ways, re re used racist comments about the Russians. We're going to send them back to their ice, he said. So, in other words, in many ways the Slavics were not really fully developed human beings, as we have seen over and over and over. And um, between 1800 and 1899, I think uh, Michael says something, he doesn't know how many wars, how about a thousand almost wars, small, big and small around the world between that period, 19th century. It's an incredible monstrous thing that, I mean, all of them have blood on their hands. And the reason I mentioned activism is precisely for, for that, that is constantly recurring. It is constantly coming back. It's also exhibiting characteristics of the old days. Today, we see that. I'm not shocked by seeing children of Ukraine being burned because when you look at human history, that's nothing new. Yes, we do have mag you know, magnitude of killing very, you know, the level of atrocities and, and and, and um, uh, yeah. on civility, you know, even though they were all called civilized people. So in 19th century ends, and then at the turn of the century, what do we have? The turn of the century, we still have the multipolar system. In the turn of the century, we have World War I, 1914 to 1918. Incredible amount of idealism on the part of President Wilson of America and the Tsar Alexander. Dustin mentioned uh, Rasputin. Yes, Rasputin. You know who was the was called who was called a monster monk, uh, actually advising Tsar Alexander II. And. In many ways, Tsar Alexander II seemed to borrow from that quite a bit of, of his treatment of, of people. But at the turn of the century, the Bolsheviks of Com came to power. And with confiscation, one after another, seizing. In other words, a truly uh, a, a recreation of the Tsar empire of the Tsars in a different, with different set of rhetorics and ideology. And it really, I cringe when I hear the term that they were communists or they were socialists. <laughs> to me, they were pathetic state capitalists, nothing but the state capitalism. Show me one, one characteristic of socialism or communism that existed in Russia during the Soviet era. One, <laughs> wage labor. I mean, getting paid according to the value you create. What was it? because they call themselves communists like North Korea does now, of course, understandably. So in, 19, in World War I, 10 million people lost their lives. 21 million people were wounded and 8 million were still missing, I think. Never mind the, uh, of course, the mass graves that were created. Um, in, in the, during, before the, 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 uh, Soviet, the Soviets took over the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia, the United States sent individuals, I think it was Willoughby, Willoughby Smith, Willoughby Smith, I think it was named, who actually borrowed from Hollywood in order to stir the public against, against Lenin, against the, the Soviets. So the intervention in caucuses and 
later on part as part of the heartland, really nothing new. It has, it has a very, very long history. In World War II, 50 to 80 million people were dead. Again, we have in between World War I, World War II, we have the rise of Nazis and the fascists. In many ways, trying to preserve capitalism, albeit in a different form than North American capitalism. They came to rescue capitalism. And of course, it's, it doesn't always happen that it, you, know, it, you get what you plan for. You know, outcome is always different because of there are different forces. Inputs. Then you have the Cold War from 1947 to 1991. We have the rise of NATO in 1949, rise of Warsaw Pact in, in, the, in 1955. Some people say as a reaction. The same argument that we hear today is the West that is encroaching upon Russian territory. Therefore, Russia has to create a buffer zone between itself and Western Europe which is true, by the way, we have ample evidence. I, th I think Mearsheimer, John Mearsheimer from New York, Chicago, uh, who wrote a devastating paper on the Israeli lobby in this country, has a book, of course, that shows that the United States really was responsible for, in many ways, not expecting a Russian invasion, but the United States was encouraging uh, Ukraine, Ukraine to join NATO and build an air base and, and very base and naval, build a naval base and so on and so forth. So in other words, so like 2014, then Crimea, of course, happens because of, again, the threat to Russian, what, what they call the Russian territory or because NATO was encroaching. Now, USSR, of course, uh, did control the heartland. USSR did control the heartland. The heartland is, has four, um, boundaries. Three boundaries are mountains. The east and the west and the south. And the north, of course, is the, uh, the Arctic Ocean, frozen. So in other words, McKenna was arguing that whoever controlled the heartland would control the rest of the world, as, as Alexander so uh, you know, nicely put it. Then, of course, we noticed that that was challenged by people not only before, I just heard that from my, my friend John Ryan sitting over there, uh, brought up the issue of Mahan as a part of, as a strategist for US naval uh, force, that it is really the, the naval power that can change the course of history. And then the Speckman, of course, in 1930s and 40s continued to challenge McKenders on the notion of heartland, and he introduced a Remland. If you have access, if you have, if you control the beaches, if you control naval, uh, naval waters, strategic waters, then you have the upper hand. So in the case of the heartland, notice though, the Nazi the strategists like Carl Schmidt didn't see that really because they weren't dealing with the naval force. They didn't have naval force as such because the land is, is all connected through land. So Carl Schmidt, again, uh, Dustin pointed out that Carl Schmidt and who was that, Schuhaufer? Uh, and few other of these Nazi, yeah, Nazi geographers who really encouraged that, the idea of living in space. It's interesting how they redefine some of the concepts, the concept of the state, the concept of territory and Grubrum. Did I get it right, Dustin? Grubrum, which means large area large area, living a space. In other words, the state has the power, the, the right to define a certain territory at its own, but still they call it something else. That's exactly what colonialists did. King Leopold of Belgium killed 10 million Congolese, 10 million people, because he declared that as almost his own private property. He had the right to do that, as indeed most of the colonial Empires. They, Germany slaughtered almost a hundred thousand Pararos and the in the Sands and and the um, and others in Namibia. A hundred thousand. Just recently, they they apologized for that. I don't show, I'm not <laughs> sure how far their apology goes. No, no, no. So, we and then of course in the process, while while Putin is struggling to bring back that. You know, started in 1990s, in 1990s, the battered, humiliated Russia. On the one hand, we see the rise of China. 
We see China. Interestingly, recently a book by Condoleezza Rice published said that we were, we were trying hard to get Russia back into the family of global capitalism. And we tried hard to get China into global capitalism. We could not get Russia in, but we did get, it's very possible because of Heartland, because of Eurasia. It's very possible. And, and, the, and the close proximity to NATO. But it, 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 they got, finally they got China to come, come back. 1978, with the rise of Dao Xiaoping, we see a, a terrific burst of energy within Russia, within Chinese economy, rising private sector, state, state enterprises, going out there, getting the technology providing environment for investment for the global capitalists to come. If you really want to fight global capitalism, this is how you start. You can't fight global capitalism if you're hungry and miserable and your own people hate your guts. You got to become powerful. You got to become strong enough because what the global capitalism controls is not only technology, but also money, a universal currency. I was in Russia in the year 2000. Their own ruble, people didn't even want to take ruble. They wanted dollars. They knew I was coming from the state. So that goes to show, that goes to show that if you don't have a solid foundation in your own country, forget about the outside. Let's take care of that one first. You know, I, I was hopeful that maybe Venezuela and Iran, a few others could come up with a sort of a bank. I called that my article then wrote it then it was, it was naive of me to think that even they were even capable of taking the first step, call it Bank of the South. <clears throat> but, but that one, of course, was just an idea that the only way to fight global capitalism is to come up with a currency that is acceptable among some countries that you can buy and sell things, not using dollars and euros as medium of exchange. So we have the, um, the rise of now Putin. From 1991, with humiliation of Russia, and of Putin became president in 2000. He was acting president in 2000, by the way. Acting president. And we know that he was very upset because he was somebody during the Soviet, right? He was a station in East Germany, I believe, as the head of KGB there. We talk about activism. Here it is again, Mr. Putin, now the president. What does he do? First thing he does is one by one eliminates his, his opponents. He poisons them. Okay. But what happened to really to the Russian economy? What when did you hear anything of, of value coming from Russian economy other than oil and gas? Hey, we had a great, we had in Iran, we had a car called Moscovich. Moscovich. I think they use the same material they use in tanks to build that. That was just an incredibly strong car, station wagon. I don't know even what happened to that one. It's very interesting that China, Mao Zedong, after coming to power, the first trip they made to Moscow was in 1952, I believe, 53. He visits a car manufacturer, a car factory, and says, ha, ah, this is what we want for China. In other words, from the get-go, the Chinese, not as much Mao, but certainly the Chinese um, political public bureau, the, the, the political class in China decided that at some point that yes, they can continue to be self-sufficient, be autonomous, independent of global capitalism and develop themselves, but it did not work. It did not work. And of course, notice one point some billion people, uh, you can't really, would be wishful thinking. You have to, you have to do things, and that's why they entered, uh, you know, agreements with global capitalism that they can provide cheap labor in return for maybe some technology at some point. Of course, that happened later on. So the rise of China, then it is, it is very much a, a problem for, for Russia also, because. China is the one that actually through a one belt, one road initiative is right now in many ways taking over Eurasia. Not, not Russia's military might, but Chinese economic cooperation. 
China is not looking to repeat the same mistakes that imperialists of the 19th century made or the 20th century. They're trying to work with you, cooperation. I think our colleague from China mentioned that yes, the policy is cooperation. But let's not forget, but also China is in the business of using child labor in Madagascar and a lot of other places. The, the mud that is used for cell phone, rare earth metals. Uh, in, in Congo, of course, the, um, what is that mine, the, the metal that is used, it's very rare. Anyways, if you look at the documentaries that, that uh, are made on the basis of what Chinese literally capital does to Africa, and almost what, 1 million people, 1.5 million people there, they're not there to do any, they're there because they don't want to live in China. They're much better off. It reminds me of the Europeans who went to Africa and in, Af in Europe, they were nobodies, but in, in Africa, they were somebody. In other words, they had respect. They had access to resources. So the last part of my paper, of course, is the, the quarter of the paper is geopolitical economy in the post-Soviet Eurasia. Again, I'm looking at the, Eurasian heartland uh, for imperial project that it didn't work uh, and it has never even worked for the Western Europeans. We can see repeated um, attempt at takeover of Eurasia by, the, by, the, by Napoleon and then by the Nazis, all of them failed. And the, the, because of, and in many ways, like a lot of argues in, in the grand strategy of Roman empire, they, you know, they, they're just constantly, there is this expansionist uh, philosophy that it really defines them, truly an, an empire. And as long as there is expansion and the only thing that they emphasize thereafter is expansion, they're going to encounter obstacles one after another. How Germanic tribes rose up against Rome and did it in, and eventually was forced to go become Eastern Roman empire. And in many ways, we see the fate of the empires. And again, I, if really anybody wants to um, understand the significance of Eurasia, I don't think Putin is, is the rhetoric coming from Putin is, is going to do much, really. What we need to do is to look at global context in which Eurasia may or may not be important at some point, you see. I, I mean, but it is now made important by the Russians themselves. That whoever controls that heartland controls the world. No, I don't think so. It just doesn't, we don't have any evidence to suggest that. So, um, and then one thing, by the way, respect to Dugan, uh, yeah, this is, this guy may be dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous because someone like Putin listens to this guy. Like, like the colonialists in the 19th century who really didn't really have much use for this kind of rhetoric. See, but I mean, they did use, however, those were on the background. The Africans, you know, the cannibals, and you know, when they were chasing them out of the villages, they call them cannibals. They thought they were after them to eat them. It's so, so there is, there is that uh, connection between social science, philosophy, religion, education, racism, sexism, et cetera, et cetera, ethnocentrism, and the logic of the empire. The empire requires. It has to crush all these things and obstacles in its path in order to, um, to be successful. So um, anyways, but thank you very much. And I have quite a few things about uh, one build, one, uh, one, um, one road, one built uh, by China. And of course the rise of multipolarity again. Now we're entering multipolar system. Then the question is, should we expect World War III as Michael, I hope that you're wrong, Michael, but, uh, but then again, it's very possible. The, the multipolar system, uh, as these empires begin to grab more territories for more resources, they're gonna clash and it's very possible. But I don't know if anybody in the right mind wants to have World War III because of the, all the uh, weapons of mass destruction that we have. I don't know. I hope that that fear enough is is enough to stop a World War III. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mehdi.
Thank you very much. Uh, now the floor is mine. Yours, all yours. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed all the contributors and all the presentation. I'm going to make a very short presentation because hopefully if you guys, all of you agree, we will expand this and make it into a paper. And even we may have a series of these lectures uh, and we will analyze from different uh, perspectives this event which is ongoing. So mine is going to be very short. The title actually I chose for my presentation is how could we conceptualize the invasion of Ukraine by Russia? I think this event could be analyzed from different viewpoints. But my theoretical stance is critical new colonial approach. By this concept, I mean, I mean that the age of colonialism is not over, but it, but it has entered a new age, which needs to be critically appraised. Secondly, I would like to draw your attention to this point that in colonial and post-colonial as well as decolonial discourses, we are mainly focused and concentrated on Euro-Atlantic forms of colonialism and new colonialism and less discuss the Russian and Eurasian forms of colonialism. In other words, in my reading, Russia is a colonial power and has clearly demonstrated all forms and patterns of colonialism since the fall of Kazan in 1556. The siege of Kazan was the final battle of the Russo-Kazan wars and led to the fall of the Khanate of Kazan. Of course, the conflict continued after the fall of Kazan. However, as rebel governments formed in Chalim and Mishatmak, and a new Khan was invited from Nogad. This guerrilla war lingered until 1556. Just in parenthesis, maybe it would be good to to mention this as well. The fall of Kazan and the fall of Tatar was actually in a way affected the Iranian position as well. When people talk about the Muslim world, they mainly focus on the fall of Spain or the fall of, uh, what's the name, Andalusia and the repercussions of the fall of uh, Andalusia and the Muslim world. But very rarely in the Western literature, they focus or they talk about the fall of Kazan and how that fall affected the Muslim world, including Iran and uh, Turkey later on in, in the 18th and 19th century. Anyway, the Russian colonization stretched as far as North America. This part of colonialism has not been discussed extensively, but it covers the period from 1732 to 1867, when the Russian Empire laid claim to the North, to North and Pacific Coast territories in the Americas. Russian colonial possessions in the Americas are collectively known as Russian. America, but this part very rarely today people discuss about it, especially within the uh, academic discourses. After the demise of the Tsarist Russia, we witness another and more complex form of Russian colonialism, and that is the Soviet style of colonialism, which has not been studied in this life. 
On the contrary, the Soviet period of Russian colonialism has often, be has often been conceptualized as ideological conflict between East versus the capitalist West. But in this form of reading, the subjectivity of colonized people under the Soviet colonialism has been suppressed by both scholars of the <laughs> communist East and the capitalist West. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have entered the third stage of the Russian colonialism, which has not been analyzed in a careful fashion. The brutal suppression of the Caucasian people was never discussed under the concept of Russian colonialism, but in all three stages, i.e. the empire style of colonialism, which started after the fall of Kazan, and the second stage, which was ideological style of colonialism, which is better known as Soviet period. And the third one, which may today is getting more currency. Some of you mentioned, for example, the ideology of Eurasianism, and even it could be called some kind of Russian nationalism, which is very, if it's not more dangerous, but it is dangerous as the other two previous stages. But in all three stages of the Russian eras, other imperial, so, imperial Soviet Union and the Russian Federation, one can discern patterns of colonial and new colonial sorry, new colonial domination. But I think there is a substantial, mm -hmm. maybe when we try to understand this invasion of uh, Ukraine, maybe this aspect or this notion could help us a little bit more in terms of analytical tools. And that is, there is a substantial difference between the Russian colonialism and European as well as the American model. And that is the land orientation of the Russian colonialism, i.e. the Russian model of colonialism is less marine oriented and more it expands through mm -hmm. land appropriation as though it is scared to step beyond the seas. When we look at the model of the Russian colonialism, it's mainly based on land appropriation, all the time trying to change the borders and create new frontiers, because there is a difference, difference between border and frontier. So the Russian colonialism during these three stages has demonstrated very, very clearly that all the time tries to destabilize the opponents by calling or by naming or by conceptualizing the territories as, as frontiers. When it can establish frontier style concept or image, then it gains some kind of moral legitimation to move forward. And that has been done during, for example, the time when the Russian came towards Caucasia and Central Asian part of Iranian territories during 18th and 19th century. In other words, the invasion of Ukraine demonstrates demonstrate once again the land orient orientation of the Russian colonialism. This is the base of the paper I'm trying to work on. I hope I could give you like a very concise idea about how I understand the invasion of Ukraine. I think it actually is part of what we may call it Russian style of colonialism and new colonial policy. Thank you very much. So, 
Now the, floor, now the floor. Now the floor is yours. If anybody has questions, answers, please. Yeah. We have five up to ten minutes to, to wrap up the whole okay. seminar. Um, I was going to mention. You know, what's the possibility of Russians um, resorting to proxy wars? I, proxy wars have been around since. You know Athens and Sparta. You said it. He mentions that in you know the Persian Wars. Sorry. Um, and in the case of Ukraine, what what is it that the, if if Russians cannot pull through, cannot uh, subdue Ukraine, uh, and what are the possibilities that there will be a uh, war of attrition, war, a, a proxy war. You know, I mean, we've seen the recent proxy wars about Vietnam and Vietnamization of war by Nixon and mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Angola, and, you know, and, and Yemen. Uh, pardon? Yes, Who? Syria. 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 Syria, absolutely. So what are what are the possibilities that they we're going to see a burst of proxy wars around the world? Um, you know, and particularly in the case of Ukraine, if the if the West does not um, give up its um, its claim on Ukraine as part of NATO is supposed to be, and I just don't understand why would NATO want have one of you know, Ukraine uh, in its in its as part of the camp because they already got Turkey, the second most powerful army in NATO there, right next to Russia. They got Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. And not to mention Poland and whole other these others, 30 countries that are members. Why would so how would Russia deal with that if you know right now it is is turned the whole country against itself, you know, the Ukrainian people? So the question is, if they cannot sustain that war, then what's the likelihood of resorting to some sort of proxy war? Oh, it just that would be a terrible, I think, you know, for for uh, Ukrainians. Yes, Alexander or Charles, anybody? I think uh, the Russians did use some, you know, they, they were called the little green man in Eastern Ukraine. No, uh, uh, no patches, no military insignia. You don't know who they were, quite possibly uh, Russian special forces. Um, if this thing goes on further, I think we may have the potential of, of, of uh, proxy okay. war. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that elements from the Ukrainian army or um, mercenaries from Ukraine, they participated in the war uh, in Syria. They sided up with Jabhat al-Nusra. We have evidence that they also were with ISIS. Mm -hmm. And some of these people, uh, uh, US is actually transferring them Visa with Turkey, interestingly, back to Ukraine. Um, videos have come out. Um, there are mercenaries from around the world that are joining Ukraine, either on their own accord or they're with giant uh, um, private armies, shall we say. But would you still call them mercenaries? Because if they're there to help Ukraine, I think if, if Russians were to send their Wagners, what are they called the group, the mercenaries? It's called Wagners, isn't it? Yeah, the Wagner group. Wagner, 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 Wagner group. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be mercenary. I don't know if somebody goes to help Ukraine, would we still consider it mercenary? You know what I mean? In terms of in terms of dialogue, to see really, you know, what are we trying? What are we trying to understand these two warring factions. So without taking side, I guess uh, I don't know. Would that be considered mercenary? You know, if if some Cuban, you know, former revolutionaries go to Ukraine. Which yeah, is very unlikely, but uh, or somebody from I don't know the Czech Republic, um, would they be considered mercenaries in Ukraine? Well, we don't know where their funding comes from. Uh, we are told that these people act on, on their own accord. But so we're going to follow the the money trail, but that's very difficult to 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 actually accomplish. Yes. Yeah. Very difficult to accomplish. But we do have evidence that some you know people from Syria are actually going back. And, and, and to Ukraine, it's very disturbing. Chechen, Chechen people also from Russia. Chechens, yeah. Well, there's Chechen. There's there was a Chechen death squad not too long ago. 
that we're trying to get Zelensky. Um, but but ultimately, I think there are other players, state players in this. Uh, Saudi Arabia has wanted to destabilize the Caucasus for the longest time. They didn't exactly make these intentions hidden. So if the Russian failures keep, you know, keep continuing, then they're going to have a, a mess of all these other um, non, uh, perhaps non-state yeah. actor participant, participants in this. Yeah. It's just so many victims. 400 million people rely on Ukrainian grain. Yeah, I 400 have, uh, million around the world that you know that rely on U Ukraine's food export, and see. now that has come to a halt mm -hmm. in uh, North Africa, Yemen, Syria. Really, the most beat up group of people. I mean, you're not talking about individuals who have options of buying from other places. I mean, I guess Argentina, Russia, U.S., and China could increase mm -hmm. their exports to those places, but how are they going to pay for it? Let me quote you some stats that, that may be interesting, maybe of interest to you and our viewers. Europe imports 40% of its gas from Russia. We all know that. Um, we all know that Ukraine is a second, uh, has the second biggest oil reserves in Europe. This whole thing is about uh, oil and natural gas, by the way. It's not talked about. Uh, I wrote a paper on that not too long ago. Uh, Ukraine is the top five one of the top five exporters of corn in the world. Uh, Russia and Ukraine together comprise 20% of the corn supply. 70% of Russia's wheat exports go to West Asia and Africa. Um, the top five uh, importers of Russian uh, wheat, the first one is Egypt at 7.39 billion billions of dollars. Turkey is the second one, 4.96 billion. Nigeria is 1.29 billion. Sudan, 1.32 billion. And Bangladesh at 1.9 billion. And uh, so you're going to have, every time there's a 10% rise in crude oil, it's about point, half, a per, half 1% to inflation, which in those of you who are not from here, uh, we are at a 40 year high inflation. Uh, 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 8%. Yeah, 8.3 yeah, 8 is actually a yeah. uh, disaster. 40 year uh, 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 record that was broken. Uh, Russia at the moment has 5,534 5, sanctions against it. Iran is at 3,616. Uh, 3, uh, Syria, 2,608. North Korea, 2077, followed by Venezuela, Myanmar, and Cuba. So, uh, uh, you know, the situation is, is, is going to, yeah. I think, only get worse. Uh, the, our Chinese colleague is not here, but yeah. uh, he was mentioning, uh, you know, the trade with China, the, 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 the aggregate uh, trade volume between China and Russia is only $147 billion, whereas the aggregate trade, two-way trade between uh, China and U.S. and EU combined is 1.6 trillions of dollars. Right. Yeah, I mean, money has its own logic. So yeah, yeah, yeah. China, China is interesting. China throws a bone to Russia because really they don't want to offend the U.S. That's where the money is. Yeah. Over three trillion dollars of U.S. securities are held by Chinese. You see, but yeah, I'm sorry, Michael. You, you know, there's only. It seems that. It, the, the condition, the, the human condition is such on a global level that we have to have a crisis of some sort to reveal how vulnerable we are. You know, mm -hmm. COVID tested all the healthcare systems around the world. Here, Russian war in Ukraine tests the ability of people to eat. Uh, you know, and so there is really no long-term planning. And that's really what capitalism is incapable of. You see, capitalism doesn't have long-term strategic plan. It's always short-term oriented profit. That's the unfortunate part. There is, and the system, if, of course, itself is not going to just relinquish its grip on, uh, on power. Yes, oh, sorry, Michael. OK, oh. it's now we are running out of time. Uh, thank you very much, all of you guys. And uh, if it is possible, I would be very happy to have your papers, full papers, by maybe July or uh, 
August. Then we can actually publish these uh, discourses, these wonderful discourses, as a book published by our journal called, I mean, our uh, house called Ekpirosis. Yeah. I will I, send we have two email. books coming up. We have two books coming up for Ekpirosis. One is uh, my yes, dissertation. Yes. We're going to turn it into a book. It's almost done. Great. And then uh, yes. we, what we're working on, what's say it? Yeah. On Shariati. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry, have a good thank you. Have a good Michael day. Michael had a question, I think. Uh, thank sorry. you, Charles. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Michael. Sorry, thank I you stole your time. time. <laughs> thank uh, you, everybody. Very nice. Bye. Appreciate bye. it.